In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Today is the Sunday before Nativity. Before the Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ in his flesh most pure. And we heard from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the genealogy of Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This genealogy is split into three portions of, genera- of 14 generations each. First, from Abraham to David. Then, second, from David to Jeconiah. And from Jeconiah to Joseph. So much can be said about this great and wondrous mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God in the flesh and the two genealogies found in the Gospel of St. Matthew and the other in the, Saint, in the Gospel of St. Luke. So, as you know, the Gospel of St. Matthew's reading today only goes back to Abraham, but in, in the Gospel of St. Luke, it goes all the way to Adam and to God, in reverse order, of course. So why do they differ, and what parts are the same? We could demonstrate that Christ is both the son of Abraham, through whom the promise came, and the son of David, the king of Israel, and even the son of Adam, who is the son of God, through the genealogy of St. Luke. How both Joseph and Mary were of the house of David, fulfilling the prophecies. We can also speak about how the Apostle Matthew is demonstrating the faithfulness of God to his promises or the pre-incarnate theophanies occurring at the appointed times before his incarnation as types of what were to come. All of this would be to our great benefit. But let us instead, let us instead reflect specifically on what the church is telling us about this great feast on this beautiful, and you know, we can glean this from the beautiful hymnography that, the, that is sung both at Grace Vespers and at Orthros. And in this, we can gain a deeper understanding. So what mystery is she bringing to our attention? If we were to summarize the emphasis of what the church hymns show us in this commemoration, it would be the mystery of the incarnation from these two events. Daniel in the lion's den in the, and in the fiery furnace, the three holy youths, and the one who is likened to the Son of God, to a Son of God, it says. If you were able to attend the services yesterday evening, you would have heard some of the most beautiful hymnography of, this, of the year. The service of Great Vespers has as its central point the hymn of Psalm 140 and 141, which begins with the melismatic hymn of, O Lord, I have cried. Interwoven between the verses of Psalm 141 are the hymns of Troparia that are called Stikira, which are always themed for the festival, com- the festival commemoration of that particular day. So in the case of last night, you would have heard the themes of both the resurrection and the Sunday before the nativity. So let's look a bit closer at each of these stikira in order to see what the church is teaching us about the significance of this commemoration. From the first stikira at Great Vespers, we hear the following. As we the faithful celebrate today the forefathers' memory, let us praise Christ the Redeemer and our King who magnified them in the midst of all the nations upon the earth and through faith accomplished strange and wondrous signs, performing marvels and miracles, since he is powerful and strong, and who from them hath shown unto us the rod of power prophesied, Mary, the child of God, who alone had no experience of man, and from whom came the flower, the promised Christ, who sprouted life for all, inexhaustible delight, and our salvation to eternity." So what came out to me in this one, and maybe to you as well, uh, is what is meant by the rod, that rod of power prophesied and from whom came the flower. So if we think about what was contained in the Ark of the Covenant, it, were, it was three things. 
the law given in tablets of stone, the manna, and the rod that budded the flower when the high priest was chosen. The Virgin Mary is both the ark and the rod that budded forth Christ. The ark, because her womb contained the uncontainable God himself, our Redeemer and King. And the rod, because from her womb came our high priest, who makes the sacrifice upon the heavenly altar. Christ is our Redeemer and salvation to eternity, and not only to a particular nation and people, but now to all the nations of the earth. Let's hear in the Old Testament reading about this particular passage uh, of the the, the rod that budded forth the flower. It's taken from Numbers. And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and take from them twelve staffs, one from the leader of each tribe. Write each man's name on his staff and write Aaron's name on the staff of of Levi, because there must also be the staff of the head of each tribe. Place the staffs in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I I meet you with you. The staff belonging to the man I chose will sprout. And that's a bad printout here, sorry. (laughs) And I with myself, the one constant, and and then no more grumbling will, will, will come from against you. So Moses spoke to the Israelites. And each of the leaders gave them a staff, one from each of the leaders of the tribes, twelve staffs in all. And Aaron's staff was among them. Then Moses placed the staffs before the Lord in the, te- in the tent of the testimony. The next day, Moses entered the tent of the testimony and saw that Aaron's staff, representing the house of Levi, had sprouted, put forth buds, blossomed, and produced almonds. Then Moses brought out all the staffs from the Lord's presence to all the Israelites. They saw them, and each man took his own staff. And if, you got, if you'll notice this, this, sim, this symbolic representation of this in, in our church, you'll see in the icon of the Theotokos, as you enter into the narthex, there's a flower on the Theotokos. This is what this symbol is, because he is our high priest, but not according to the order of Levi, but according to the order of Melchizedek. And on the seven-branch candle stand in the altar there, those are almond uh, blossoms. And so this is deeply symbolic and deeply, like, it, it gives us a great insight into the mysteries that are occurring before our eyes here. So the second stikira says the following. As in a gentle shower midst of flame, the children of God rejoiced, as they walked about the midst, about, about amidst the spirits do, and in the flame they mystically did prefigure the Trinity, and the wondrous incarnation of Christ God, since they were wise by their faith in God, they quenched the power of the fire, and righteous Daniel, who was also seen, to muzzle lions in the den, since thou, O friend of man, art entreated by their prayers in our behalf, rescue us all, O Saviour, from the eternal fire that naught can quench and vouchsafe that we attain unto thy kingdom in the heavens, O Lord. So here in the second stikira, we have a reference to the unquenchable fire that cannot be quenched. But yet, the holy youths experience the fire as a refreshing and dewy breeze. Here, the fire seems to be intelligible, as St. John Chrysostom says, which means it's real. For he says, but it both destroys the guards who cast forth the use into the fire, while at the same time preserving them in the midst of the flames. Preserving the use in the midst of the flames. So here the church is showing us that the love of God is a consuming fire, and that this love can either be experienced as a fire of torment or as a life-giving fire that refreshes us for eternity. However, the spirits do can only be acquired through humility repentance, prayer, and all the ascetical practices. That brings us into union with God, which the youths and Daniels both demonstrated to us for before they went into the flames, before they went into the furnace, and especially Daniel before he uh, interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he fasted. And same with the youths, they fasted beforehand. And there was even a competition about you know, the diet between the, the youths and Daniel versus the, uh, the, the other eunuchs. So, if we are prideful, 
and a slave to our passions and, and faithless and unbelieving, then the spiritual flame is experienced as torment. So through obedience to God's commandments, however, fasting and prayer, Daniel was able to shut, uh, shut the mouths of the lions and interpret the, the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. He was taken up to heaven and given divine vision of the ancient of days, being carried on the four beasts, which prefigured the four gospel writers. We are all called to the same vocation, and may God give us the grace to follow their examples. In the third stikira, it says, When in the furnace of the blazing flame, thy holy and faithful youths prove to be as in a cool, refreshing dew, then did they mystically portray from before that thou wast to come from a virgin whom thy brightness would not burn. I beheld until the thrones were set in place and the judges sat for judgment and then rushed forth the river and from there rushed forth the river of fire that from which may we be saved by their entreaties our master Christ. And here we are told the mystery of the furnace being a type of the womb of Mary, which contained God's brightness, yet did not burn her. And a fourth figure appears in the midst of the flames, one who is likened to, the son, to a son of God. This, of course, is a pre-incarnate theophany of Christ himself, the son of God, whom the, Babylonians, the Babylonian king sees as an angel in the midst of the flames. Immediately, the hymns tie this mystical portrayal of his first coming in the Incarnation already to his second coming, when Christ will come in glory on his judgment seat, and the river of fire that flows from him can either be our salvation to everlasting, uh, our salvation or our everlasting torment based on our orientation. If we are prepared through a life given to repentance and taking up our cross daily, God will confirm us or conform us to his likeness. And we will experience him as did the holy youths and Daniel. So, in case anybody has any doubt of what the church is teaching us about the ever virginity of Mary herself, the Theotokos, or is scandalized by this, let us hear the blessed Theophylact his very succinct argument putting our doubts to rest. He uses two quotes that cause the most confusion, the, the two quotes that cause the most confusion from the Holy Scriptures. And then he clarifies them. First from the prophet Isaiah. Behold, quote, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. End quote. So the Jews say that it is written in the prophecy, not virgin, but young woman. To which it may be answered, virgin and young woman mean the same thing in scripture. For in scripture, young woman refers to one who is still a virgin. Furthermore, it was not a virgin that gave birth. If it was not a virgin that gave birth, how would it be a sign? Something extraordinary. Listen to Isaiah who says, for this reason, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin. If it was not a virgin, who gave birth? Or who gave birth? It would not be a sign. It's a very simple, very simple argument. The second passage is this, quote, But knew her not until she had born a son, end quote. Here the, of the, the use of the word until might give some doubt as to whether she remained a virgin after giving birth. So now let us listen to this simple logical reasoning from the Blessed Theophylact to dispel any doubt in our minds. Quote, Until here does not mean that before the birth he did not know her and then afterwards he did, but that he absolutely never knew her. Scripture employs this expression, for example, quote, The raven returned not unto the ark until the water had dried off from the earth. End quote but neither did it return after it had dried off. Again, quote, I am with you until the end of the world, end quote. So after the end of the world, he will no longer be with the saints? But how can this be? 
For in that time, more than ever, will he be with them. So must you understand here, until she brought forth, to mean neither before the birth nor after the birth did he know her. How could he, how could he have touched the Holy Virgin, having once understood the ineffable birth giving? <clears throat> Lastly, let us hear from St. Gregory Polymus on the, on the meaning of this day from his homily on the genealogies. This is just an excerpt from it. Quote, Impossible to recount is Christ's descent according to his divinity, but his ancestry according to his human nature can be traced. Since he who deigned to become son of man in order to save mankind was the offspring of men. And it is the genealogy of his that two of the evangelists, Matthew and Luke, recorded. But although Matthew, in the passage from his gospel read today, begins with those born first, he makes no mention of anyone born before Abraham. He traces the line down from Abraham until he reaches Joseph, to whom, by divine dispensation, the virgin mother of God was betrothed, being of the same tribe and homeland as him, that her own stock may be shown from this to be in no inferior way. Luke, by contrast, begins not with the earliest forebearers, but the most recent, and working his way back from Joseph, the betrothed. He does not stop at Abraham, nor, nor having included Abraham's predecessors, does he end with Adam, but lists God among, his, um, among Christ's human forebearers, wishing to show, in my opinion, that from the beginning man was not just a creation of God, but also a son in the Spirit, which was given to him at the same time as his soul through God's quickening breath. It was granted to him as a pledge that if, waiting patiently for it, he kept the commandment, he would be able to share through the same spirit in a more perfect union with God, by which he would live forever with him and obtain immortality. So you see, in a similar and mysterious way, we have become sons of God by grace through our baptism and chrismation. We have now been grafted into Christ the true vine and are being transformed into his likeness as from the beginning when God breathed the Spirit into Adam. What a great and strange mystery do we behold in this glorious act. May we, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, hold to our baptismal vows and finish the course well. Now, having no doubt in our minds of the works of wonder wrought before us, let us be encouraged to keep this feast with joy. Having finished the course of the fast, let us do God's commandments in love for one another, that, in so doing, we will behold a strange and wonderful mystery. Heaven is the cave, the cherubic throne, the virgin, the uncontainable God whom we magnify in song. Now may our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, through his incarnation, plant in us the divine seed and growing into the tree of life. May we bear the fruits worthy of our repentance. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.